Our, to, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Michael, Mike, Michael Phillips, uh, you mentioned your intense frustration with the final 40 minutes. Uh, you alluded to that a little bit. Would, would you say some more, please? I don't want to hijack this thing, but, but uh, mm, boy. I've never, you know, I've never written about this film, so in a way I'm sort of feeling my way through the frustration, never having actually dealt with it properly. But um, I, I, think, I think until in the, in, the, in the somewhat shorter version, without this additional 49 minutes or so, the, the film knows precisely where it's going, and, and, it's, and it's a mixture of the phantasmagoric and the, uh, and the more realistic to me is just inspired. And then the, the, when, when, when you arrive, when you arrive and the, the Dennis Hopper greets the remaining uh, people, <laughs> I just, I, I feel like it's not just a matter of the story becoming static, but I, I just feel like uh, the, 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 what little we see of Kurtz and hear from him as improvised largely by Brando and um, but also, you know, as sort of shaped by Coppola, I just feel like it's illustrating one point over and over, and we've we've heard it, and I, I even though I, I do kind of love that cross cut between the sacrifice and the the steer and and the killing of Kurtz, um, I, I just I, it's I don't have I don't I wish I had a better more interesting more precise way to put it, but that that's my frustration with it. I, it might be something as simple as and, and as uh, non-intellectual as uh, momentum versus stasis, you know? I don't know. Well, and some, maybe a couple have read too much T.S. Eliot in high school or something, because well, well, I do well, find that burdensome. Well, this is it. I think it's not just T.S. Eliot as well. There's Rudyard Kipling in it. There's a, the, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's Hollow Man, there's Wasteland, and uh, as I oh, said. Oh, the Golden Bow, which uh, is the source of exactly, the Golden Bow. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously Lord Jim in it and, and, and uh, Heart of Darkness. There's this kind of, um, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century English literature uh, that seems to have, you know, influenced right. the way the film was written, which, which I think must have been more Coppola than Milius. To be but also, it really comes up most in the, at the end of the film, and I think that adds somewhat, for my, in my take on it, it adds somewhat to the, to the flat quality that Mike was pointing to, a little more over-literary, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's it. It's, and oddly, it's, it's, it's more faithful to the, sort of the, it's more faithful to the, not the letter of, the, of, Heart, to, of Heart of Darkness, but more, it's more faithful to the, 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 the 19th century of it, and it just doesn't feel like it fits with the rest of it. I don't know. More questions, please. Down right, over here. Yes, okay. Um, you, you all spoke about the, the tension in the film. This is the second time I've seen it. The first time I saw it in a critic screening, so it was a different uh, group. But what I was struck by was the humor that the audience seemed to derive from the film. The, this version seems to work really hard to interject humor that was certainly missing from the, the version that most of us have seen, you know, stealing the surfboard, uh, apologizing for bad surf and things like that. And I was wondering how you felt that this sort of, sort of interjection of humor uh, either helped the film or made it feel different for you all. That, uh, just real quick, uh, I, that's an that's a excellent observation because a lot, a lot of that first what, tw additional 20, 25 minutes is is kind of uh, bringing that out in that uh, I sort of miss the pre I miss the way we we said goodbye to Kilgore in the other version. I, 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 it seems to weaken him or make him far more comic when you just sort of hear the voice. So even though it's a good, it works <laughs> to have him sort of trying to get the surfboard back. But more problematic for me is this, is the scene after the Playboy Bunny show. But with the, just with you know the the tryst and the copter, I think that that to me is subpar, every which way. It, it seems to be all. It's not even in character to whatever degree we're talking about a conventionally motivated character in Willard. It's not even really in in Willard's character to buy off the bunnies with the. the I, I, I don't know. It's 15 minutes uh, that film doesn't need. Uh, it seems wrong. It, seems, it just seems off to me. Again, because the earlier scene is terrific. It's perfect. The, way, the bunny show and just the way it all turns into another melee, you know? I always sort of cry at that earlier scene just because I had this kind of, as somebody who was in San Francisco in a certain key part of my life, I had that real Bill Graham fetish too, and 
it was a waitress at Club City Own, and kind of seeing him who died in a helicopter crash, kind of seeing him in the helicopter, I always just kind of, you know, takes me out of the movie a little bit, except that he's, he's there and he's part of it, and yeah. it's just a part that I always kind of res really respond to. And there's, I mean, there's a, I think there's another um, reason for that, to why people were laughing, and I, I certainly was laughing in places that I don't usually laugh at, but it's the fact that it's become such a classic, and it's become so ingrained in popular culture that when you see Duval, you see, <laughs> hello, Duval, and then you start laughing, you know, and because you've got like-minded people here. I, I, I find this in, in, in better film festivals, to be honest, where people start reacting to certain shots or, or certain scenes, whether or not they're funny in and of themselves. It's just that the, the joy of watching this on a big screen, as this was, with people who, who are appreciating it, that brings it forward. And, you know, there are certain scenes that are just hilarious. I mean, you've got to love Duval in this film. For me, it's just, you know, I, you know uh, my, one of my favorite actors of all time anyway. It's just the fact that, you know, Bobby Duval is just, you know, that there are bombs flying and, and, and uh, you know, exploding in front of him and behind him, and he's not reacting to them. The only reaction that he gives is earlier on, as he turns around, it's as if a fly has landed on his shoulder. You know, it's so insignificant to him. You've got to love that. And I could not stop laughing for five minutes. But then again, you know, David was tickling me, so. <laughs> I was wearing my Kilgore t-shirt, too. Any, any, anything else? Balcony. Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I, this is the first time I've seen the Redux version as well. and. Um, I thought the Playboy Bunny scene actually worked um, for a number of reasons, and um, I guess the, the main one that occurred to me was that it seems to set up well, um, sorry, it seems to set up well um, a lot of the, the commentary coming from Kurtz about how soft the American attitude is and how insulated it is. Mm -hmm. But I also liked that it seems elliptically like uh, for, for a movie with very few women, uh, vaguely feminist point that the men are relating to these women in this incredibly bizarre way that's you know not even remotely um, translatable into the real world and I, I I think actually it works um, fairly well and I was just curious to see if anybody supported it but it doesn't really sound like any of you do well I, th I think for me the problem is not so much the male aspect but the way the women themselves are represented they're really airheads in that scene I mean uh, they're given Cal these kind of California, you know, typical California attitudes, like I worked at Bush Gardens or, you know, and they're stripping themselves, but also these men are like painting them and doing things with them. And one of the things that does interest me about that scene, though, is, is the fact that this motif that runs through the film of like smearing your face, creating a mask, you know, it starts at the beginning with Willard wiping blood all over his face. And then, of course, uh, Lance gets into it and decorates his face, even, I think, out of Chinese opera at one point. Isn't there one image of him with his black and red kind of eyes? Uh, and then, of course, by the end, um, Willard coming up from the mud, you know, just is drenched in that stuff. And by the end, he's, he's got the camouflage paint on, too. Uh, so it seemed to me that there's something going on there when Lance starts to dab that green dye on her face. I can't figure it out, though. I just I see it as a kind of poetic connector, but I, I don't know what to do with it exactly. Center. 